Welcome back to the High Performance Home Build. Today is the first day of concrete pour. So the tiny lab doesn't have a traditional foundation. So this is my first experience seeing a concrete pour. We're gonna have some footage of that. I'm gonna tell you a lot of the things that I've learned about foundations, which is not necessarily what people will tell you. Um, and uh, just to get the record straight, number one, we're using Forma Drain as the forms. That is a lot what this is gonna be about because all the extra steps that we took on the footings were because of this special process that we wanted to use, the Forma Drain process. And also let me make clear that I really like my contractor. My foundation contractor, I really lucked out. He is very accommodating. He will do whatever I want. But like any contractor, like any thinking person, he will first say, are you sure that's what you want? Because, uh, 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 and these are the reasons that we normally do it another way. And you need, you will be putting up with that. So what I've learned time and again is if I'm not on site advocating for myself and making sure that things happen exactly the way that I want them to, that it's just not gonna happen. And so if you are not your own general contractor, because I, in, in my opinion, you, the owner of the property, have the most interest in making sure that this thing works exactly the way that you want it to. If you're a nerd like me and you really wanna tune the invisible dynamics, you gotta get all the visible right first. You need to have somebody there to advocate for you if you can't be there. So I'm taking a year off work to do this. I would be paying somebody what I make in a year to do this for me. So it's, to me, it's break even. It's, it's a silly uh, thing to even worry about. But you need to just be there every day. And the fact that I've been here shoveling gravel and running tractors and driving the skid steer and um, shut, you know, digging holes and things like that is where all of the experience comes from. So please just make sure that you know that actual experience is very important actual scientific uh, research that you read, I'm not a researcher, I read the research and I ask researchers, is it very important? And putting those things together in the field is what it's all about. So let's go ahead and show you around. What you see here are the strip footings. This is the, the foot that the entire house is gonna sit on. Above this is gonna be a foundation wall that's gonna be tied into this with pieces of rebar uh, when we pour today. Back here we've got a pier a pier is like a column that's gonna be holding up pieces of the floor that are going long spans without support. So we've got quite a lot of piers. We've got 10 piers in here. Some of them are three foot by three foot by 12 inches deep. Some of them are two by two. All of that was specified by a structural engineer. I had an actual person who does math for a living calculate the weight of everything in the house and tell me exactly how big those need to be. I would not recommend anybody guess on any of that stuff. Now the strip footings, uh, first of all, it's not gonna be level. This is what the first interesting thing that I came up against is that we worked so hard to get this, uh, as you know from the other videos, we dug way down because somebody had buried a bunch of trash here, somebody. Um, we also found a bunch of rocks that were huge over there and we had to, we couldn't dig down through the rocks. That was just not, I wasn't interested in that. So we had to make the lowest point of the foundation for it to be flat, the height of the rock top. So we're, we're actually resting on rock over there here, we uh, raised up with very expensive dirt that I had to truck in, paid for the trucks, paid for the skid steer to spread it, paid for the soil compactor to run around and compact everything. And then it rained, and as you saw in the last video with the geotechnical engineer, we had to then dig down again. That all being said, I understand why almost everyone digs down for footings. Instead of forming up, which is what we're doing here, they would just dig a trench that is, in this case, eight inches deep, and 16 inches wide <clears throat> for the strip footing because we had to do that anyway, it turns out. So after we had already spent all this money, we then proceeded to dig like you would. We did not then proceed to pour the footing into that hole. What we did is fill it with gravel, which is not gonna get compacted any more than it is. I tamped it down um, and it's sitting in there. So now we've got this resting on nice hard dirt at the bottom. And I know that because I tested it uh, my geotechnical engineer, Jeff, taught me how to, with a piece of rebar that's an L, press into it, and you really can tell the difference. If you go out in your yard and you press down with this in topsoil, it would sink down 12 inches. Once we're down at really hard soil, if it goes in further than two, three inches tops, it's too soft. You should be able to really almost rest your entire body weight on this thing and not have it go down very deep at all. 
Now we've got this here, the forma drain is in place. The forma drain is smooth on the inside. That's where the concrete is gonna go in here. And on the outside, it's got these slots in it. The slots are for making sure that the drainage happens. It's got two cells, one on the top, one on the bottom. In every one of these joints, it, uh, there, the cells even out. And so anything that's in the top would spill down into the bottom. Likewise, the other thing that this does, and this is called a three-in-one. Forma Drain is advertised as a three-in-one. I'm gonna tell you why it's actually a four-in-one, not a three-in-one. So first of all is drainage. It's gonna take care of the drainage, and it's better at drainage than a French drain or a slotted drain tile that most people would install that would be like PVC uh, or what used to be clay, because it's lower. You're worried about water coming up, not water falling down. That was something that I learned in my research about French drains is that you, in a slotted drain tile, the, the slots don't go in the top. You're not wanting water to drip down from the top. You wanna to put them in the bottom so that when the water rises up, it then starts to evacuate through this solid pipe. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is that it is the form for the footings. We are not gonna take these away. That leads to a little bit of a problem when you're dealing with a foundation crew whose job is to put up these stakes to make sure that the forms don't move. So the stakes, they did a really great job, but normally they're allowed to drill from the inside or from the outside. That's because they're taking away the forms when they're done. So it doesn't matter which side they drill from. In this case though, since we're drilling from the inside and then we're gonna fill that with concrete and then not take the form away, I'm never gonna be able to get that screw out. So now I have to come along with a sawzall and potentially damage my form drain. So just make sure that that happens. If you're gonna use form drain or any uh, form that's gonna stay in place, you can't drill from the inside. Next in line is the radon. Field. So this is all gonna be sucked on by the Fantec Radon fan. It's also gonna then, these slots on the inside are gonna be sucking on the field of gravel that's gonna be in here. That's really important. Just sucking on the, the French drain on the outside and on the inside of the footing isn't really gonna take care of your radon problem. You wanna hit all of the interior space. That's why we're filling it with nice, you know, this rock has lots of spaces between it that can breathe. So it's gonna be sucking the radon that's whatever is coming out of the ground out to the footing and evacuating it out through the roof. The fourth thing that Forma Drain folks are not advertising is that when you do that, the side effect that I have been made aware of by my good friend Joe Nagin up in Wisconsin, who's a researcher, he's uh, like, Batman or Iron Man to me. Uh, he's just got all this stuff and he's not afraid of doing science all the time in his own spare time at home. He found that when you use an active radon system, which is where a fan actually sucks on the under the house, you get dehumidification and temperature change in the foundation products. So the corner where the slab is gonna meet up with the foundation wall normally is kind of cool and it's where you're gonna have some condensation because you've got moisture wicking up from the footing, which we're not gonna have a problem with because we have a capillary break with this gravel, and then evaporating into the space. And so we've got essentially a capillary break and we've got active drying. So in our really humid climate here in Atlanta, we're not gonna have to worry about the humidity from the capillary action of the footing. And even when there is standing water around it, we're not going to have to worry about that either because again, the fan is sucking on it. So that's a really cool four in one, uh, in my opinion. And it is worth all the extra work that we did on this because frankly, I have now the best drained, the best radon mitigated, and the most humidity controlled foundation house in this entire city. Now where you trust your contractor is in the state of the mud and the dirt. Um, these stakes are only going down six inches tops. They drive them in with a sledgehammer. And we dug down, like I told you, eight, 10, sometimes right here, for example, like 20 to 24 inches down to get to good hard soil before we started backfilling with this gravel. That means that these stakes are kind of precarious and you need to be really careful about that. So my contractor was very attentive all the time to making sure that you don't, don't lean on that, don't step over there, don't drive the tractor anywhere close to that. The rebar here is to provide the tensile strength for the concrete. Concrete's really strong when you push on it, but when you pull on it or try to bend it, it doesn't do so well. So the, the steel is there to make sure that you can't pull or kind of you know misshape in the ways that the concrete is not already good at doing. Uh, 
it needs to be up inside the concrete, not laying at the bottom. You use these things called chairs. This is a rebar chair. This is a metal one. They have plastic as well. These are really important. However, also important is that they get tied off. Uh, it was made clear to me that the way that this normally happens is in the piers inside the uh, slab area, they put the, four, the chairs there just to show the inspector where it'll be. And then they take everything out, pour four inches of concrete, and put the rebar mesh back down there and then pour on top of it. I'm not, that doesn't make me as comfortable. And there might be some of you out there who are like, oh yeah, yeah, everybody does it that way. It's not in the code books, but that's how we do it and it's better. I'm just more of a, I like to use something that's a science backed thing rather than just mojo. So I asked for these to be uh, tied with wire ties to the rebar. So we're using these and we're tying them to the rebar. That was something that I specifically had to ask for, even though then he said, well, you know that if they, if they tip over, then the whole thing is down there and you can't fix it. And I'm, you know, it's just like, there's always some con to a strategy. So just make sure that you are, you know how to approach each argument. You know the answers to a lot of the questions that you probably already thought to ask. Go ahead and ask them so you have the answers. That way when your contractor asks you, you know what to say. So these chairs are not leaving. These chairs are in there. They are tied to the uh, rebar. I'm happy about that. Another thing that became clear to me uh, yesterday when we had everything is, is set, we got this compacted, we're ready to pour today. My inspector, who's a very nice guy, came out last night um, to check this stuff out. I sent him a bunch of pictures uh, because he's a very busy guy. This is a, <laughs> yeah, they're all building inspectors, by the way, are overworked and underpaid. So I sent him a bunch of pictures and he was like, okay, that looks good. I'm gonna still just come out and take a look. He said, make sure they clean the rebar before they pour. Because apparently, and I did not know this until yesterday, concrete is supposed to bond with this steel. It's supposed to literally glue to it. And it can't do that if there's this dirt here. So I need to clean all this dirt off of it. And I've got a spray bottle just to make sure that it really happens. So I'm literally gonna go around and spray the rebar. I could ask my contractor to do this, but the fact that they didn't know that this needed to be done in the first place, and the fact that I'm already kind of a pain in the ass client, and the fact that then I would have to question how thorough they're gonna be on their cleaning compared to me, then I'm gonna have to go around and check every inch of their cleaning anyway. I might as well just do it and avoid all of the fuss of them thinking that I'm a jerk and a, a oh, t totally overbearing nerd about this stuff. So now we're ready for concrete. So several years in the making, this is the first moment that our house ceases to be just a piece of paper. I know it's an actual thing that's gonna last. Uh, this concrete is going in, and I wanted to show you a detail that I didn't show you on the little tour. So right here, you can see these little screws. Those are just simple drywall screws that are not special. They get screwed into the inside of the forma drain so that the concrete sticks to the uh, forma drain lengths. These are like 12 feet long and you want to make sure that they stick together and that they don't separate from the concrete later after it's dried. Uh, and also you can see one of the connection points, the outer form of drain and the inner form of drain are connected at the bottom so that they drain out. Now, of course, this whole thing is flat. That's the whole point is that it's flat. It's for foundation footing. So is it gonna drain naturally? No, it's not going to because it's flat. So that's why it's important to hook it up to that fan and make it the active radon system, which is also then going to evacuate the uh, evaporating water. <laughs> so let's watch the concrete pour. So one thing that I will say is that in the Forma Drain uh, installation instructions, they have that you put gravel along the outside here. What my team was worried about is that we would put so much pressure on the outside of the Forma Drain that it would push them in. And we were already on like pretty wet 
soil, so the stakes are like not as solid as they would want them to be. What we found is that we do not have that gravel on the outside because of that concern. And these forms are actually distending. They're bowing out a little bit from the pressure. They're plastic. They're not meant to be really, you know, hardcore rigid. So your options are either use more stakes or go ahead and do that gravel, uh, you know, but it's, it's a weird, you know, it's like a gray area. We do have this soil here that you can see that's just blocking the concrete from spraying out. This thing is really violent, as you can see, and so it's just trying to get everywhere, and it's very heavy. What's the matter? This. Okay. I'm sick. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, okay. It's not changing the shape of the house or the, the lengths or anything. It's fine. It's just making the forms a little bit wider than they were supposed to be and not perfectly straight. They're going to be kind of like, you know, a little bit curvy at the sides. Nothing is the problem about that. It's just that we're using a little bit more concrete than we thought, and we just weren't expecting for them to bow out like that. So take note when you use Formadrain in the future. So there's a movie that we really like called Lock. It's all inside of a car. It's just this guy on the phone non-stop. It's basically all it is. He never even gets out to go to the bathroom, and he's a concrete foreman for this pour. And so he's talking about C6 and slump tests and blah, 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 all this stuff, and the rebar and the forms. And so I really liked it. So that was my uh, tiny little prep course for this. But slump test is a term that I've heard used a lot. And I was, I'm a testing guy, so I love tests. Let's run a test. But slump test apparently is not something that you run on site. The factory runs the slump test and then puts it in the truck and sends it to you. And so apparently what we have is a uh, slump five, slump four or five, and that's because the pump it takes so long to get it out, you can't have it drier. You need to have it nice and wet so it can get through all of that pipe to get out. Ultimately, you're not gonna know for like 30 years, 50 years, you know, we want this house to last 100 years or more. So we're building every other part of it to do that. But right now, we're, you know, like hoping that everything is tuned perfectly. Again, you're not gonna find out for decades. So anyway, you just have to go with the system, go with the flow sometimes. That's what we're doing right now. Move? Yes, this house will never ever move. Is Forever. Why? Because we don't want it to move. We have a house that moves already. Most people's houses don't move. Did you know that? Why? Because Why? other people are not as um, crazy as we are. Or they're crazy, but they hide it. Yeah.